for the past couple weeks, we've been looking at four specific confusing things that Jesus said. Um, no, they're not really all that connected, but I guess in a way they are. Uh, two weeks ago, we looked at um, when Jesus said, you are gods, and what does that mean? Um, and from John chapter 10. And then last week, we looked at uh, when, it lo when it seems like Jesus is calling someone a dog and what, what that meant. Um, tonight, we're going to look at two, actually two spots of something that Jesus said, because they're oftentimes taken out of context um, to mean one thing when they're actually from two different places. And uh, so we're going to look at them, hopefully bring some, bring some uh, clarity there. Um, and uh, what I mean by these are four things that Jesus said, they're not really things that Jesus said. <laughs> I mean, in a way they are, I guess. But, uh, you know, people just kind of sometimes hear what they want to hear. <laughs> Have you ever told your kids something and uh, they said, well, you said this and you say, no, no, that's not, that's not what I said at all. The same, the same kind of thing happens with Jesus. So tonight we're going to be looking specifically more at prayer. And it seems like Jesus kind of says, hey, whatever the two of you want, just, you know, do whatever you want and it's going to happen. Um, so ask for whatever you want so long as there are two of you. And uh, these are from two different uh, passages. We're going to have to look at them one at a time. We'll start off with the first bit. Um, it was actually it was actually really funny because Pastor didn't know what I was uh, any anything of this four part series. It's been done for about three months probably now. And this morning he uh, he said many things uh, that goes back to this. If you remember, we actually looked at John fourteen this morning, this same spot. So let's let's read it through first before we start taking it apart. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own. But the Father, as he remains in me, does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I am going to the Father. Now, I do have to stop here and give a little bit of a, uh, what's it called, advertisement. Uh, Pastor has been doing a Wednesday night series where he looks more specifically at Jesus. If you have any questions um, that I don't really go into tonight. I encourage you to look that up. It's all available online, and he's still on the series, and he's been looking at that. Um, if you do not understand a few basic Christian historical doctrines, you will not understand the book of John. There's a few things that John is, it talks about. One is that Jesus is God. He always has been God. He was never created. If you don't understand that, the gospel of John is going to be very confusing. Um, another thing is that Jesus and uh, John goes to great lengths to show about Jesus's divine nature, his inability to sin, his his perfection, his eternal nature, that kind of stuff, more so than any of the other gospels. If you don't go to the book of John with that understanding, it's going to be a lot harder um, to get anything else. So I will not be looking at those specific aspects tonight. We're looking more specifically about prayer itself. And whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. I think that's what he just said, isn't it? So he repeated it there. Pay attention to that, okay? Kind of important. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then he goes off into another section there. So we'll look at this verse by verse, starting in verse 10. It was just a couple chapters ago when Jesus was having the discussion with the Jews about his deity in chapter 10. If you'll remember, I'll, 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 re I'll remind you in case you don't, this was J um, John chapter 10. We looked at it two weeks ago. And some Jews are trying to get him to say clearly, hey, I am God, so that, that way they can stone him. They, they're, they're, they go to him and say, hey, why won't you just be open with us? And then he hints around to it, and they say, okay, we're going to kill you now. And he's like, what, what are you stoning me for? Is it because of all the good things I'm doing or, or what? And... Uh, and, but we looked at that already, so I don't want to get, belabor the point. But with that being said, now we have four chapters later, and Jesus is repeating a lot of what he said in chapter 10 to his disciples one-on-one. -on -one. Um, if you're reading through John, in chapter 14, he's talking about, and actually the end of chapter 13 as well, Jesus is talking about his, the way that he's, he's going to die real shortly, um, then he's going to be resurrected, and, and then he's going to ascend into heaven. And it has this uh, a couple Q and A's with his disciples. So Thomas asks a question or makes a statement. Um, I think um, 
uh, if I remember correctly, Peter it makes one, and I think there's another one, I think Jude. I think Jude is the last one to ask a question in John chapter 14. But anyways, um, so it's kind of going through this question and answering his disciples say something, and he kind of gives a response. And um, that's the context of what we're looking at. So let's 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 real quick look at this. Um, I want to spend the most amount of time on verse 14. So the rest of these five verses, I'm only more giving you for context. We're not going to spend too much time here. The main idea of verse 10 is that him and the Father have a singular purpose. There's no conflicting motive. That, that's the main idea here. Um, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father, as he remains in me, does his works. So once again, don't really have time to get really into that. Um, pastor's been already going all kinds into depth about stuff like this, so I'm not really wanting to repeat things that he already said. But... Um, so, and so Jesus and the Father have a singular purpose. Then we get to verse 11. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. If you remember, two weeks ago when we looked at John chapter 10, where Jesus is talking to the Jews about that psalm where it says you are gods, and he's, he's, he's trying to get them to see that he is God. Um, if you remember that, this verse is like verbatim, something that he already said to those Jews. And it's repeated again here. And then we get to verse 12, which I think is probably one of the more misunderstood, misunderstood verses in the Bible. Um, I don't want to spend too long here, but I will spend long enough to explain things. Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I am going to the Father. So what we get from this, and it definitely does sound like that, especially when you're not really familiar with um, the ancient languages or the book of John itself, when you're not really familiar with those things and you go to this verse, it sounds like he's saying, hey, you're going to be better than me. You're going to do greater, you're going to be greater than me. And, you know, so greater means to be better or surpass him. Well, <laughs> We know that that's not exactly true because of other things that he said. And I'll, I'll, I'll get to this, but before I say that, it's interesting to me that in chapter 10, he said something that make it, made it sound like, you know, we're real big for our britches, right? When he's talking about the gods, and it's a little bit confusing what he's saying. Um, and then right after that, in chapter 13, he says, no servant is greater than the master. And then again, here in chapter 14, he says something that makes it sound like, Jesus was just the starter, but we're the fulfillment of it, you know, and, and so it makes it sound like it's all about us. And then again, in chapter 15, just after this, he repeats again, no servant is greater than the master. I just think that that's funny that he sandwiches the fact that no servant is greater. You guys don't, don't, don't misquote me in, in 2000 years from now. Don't misquote me about how, you know, you're going to, you're going to be better Jesuses and all these different things, little gods and all these, all this nonsense. So, um, we will not be greater than Jesus, and we will not be equal to Jesus. Um, this should be understood in context of what's happening um, in, in, the, in the gospel itself. You should definitely read John as a whole before you come to any conclusions on something like that. Because if we are to come to the conclusion that, hey, we are going to do greater than, we're going to be greater than Jesus in, in, in quality, not in quantity, but in quality, we're going to be qualitatively better than Jesus, you need to have more than just one verse out of context to back something that major up. You definitely do. So um, he already said very clearly, or actually he already said once, but he's about to say it again if you keep reading in John about how no servant is greater. But he doesn't stop there. there there's, there's two specific things that, I, that, that should be obvious to us. First off, especially since we're reading John long after the fact, so we should have better revelation of what's happening, and we shouldn't get hung up even more so. First off, we, the church, go to all the world. Did Jesus go to all the world? No. He went to the Jews. He actually clarifies this in all four of the Gospels. I came to the children. We looked at this last week, too. Um, so Jesus went only to the Jews. The church would go to all the world. So the scope would be greater, but there's more than just that. First, second off, Jesus only had an earthly ministry for three years. That's extremely limited. It's a very short time. The church has gone on for 2,000 years, and we're still going. So obviously greater there being in quantity, not in quality. We're not better than Jesus because we have existed for longer on this earth doing ministry than Jesus did. We are 
quote unquote greater. And then the next thing that I kind of want to point out that I feel like people, especially televangelists, kind of skip over this part. He makes it absolutely clear that he is the one who is enabling us to do more of what he himself started. In fact, he says that this, I'm going and I'm going to send the, son, send the spirit. He makes it absolutely clear that his going is what enables that to happen. The obvious conclusion there being that Jesus himself enables us to do what he started, which means this, he was not dependent, but we are dependent. There's a very big thing that a lot of televangelists just kind of drop off because they're so focused on talking about the, the inner power within you and all this nonsense, and it's just not Christianity. If you're going to teach something like that, I mean, fine, but don't, don't, don't put it under the label of Christianity because that's definitely not Christianity. Christianity is not about being uh, super beings or anything like that. Um, it never has been historically. So now let's go to verse 13. And whatever you ask in my name, this I will do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now, here, he's going to repeat this first part about whatever you ask in verse 14. But here, he very clearly ties it in that the, the reason that he's going to do this is to glorify God. He, he clarifies here, so that the Father may be glorified. I'm going to, whatever you ask, excuse me, whatever you ask, I'm going to answer so that the Father will, he gives, he gives the, the reason right there. And then verse 15, we'll skip over 14 for now. Uh, verse 15, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, it seems that those two things aren't, aren't really related, but they very much so are related. Because <laughs> Pastor talked about this again this morning, so it's, it's, I kind of feel like I'm ripping off part of a sermon. But um, you can only ask in Jesus' name if you live in Jesus' name. You can't live for yourself, live your own way, do your own thing, and then just say, hey, uh, I want a sports car in the name of Jesus. And I tagged on in the name of Jesus, so now God is obligated to give me what I wanted. Well, he didn't answer, so he's a liar. I can't trust him. I, I, I tried that whole prayer thing. It didn't work. You, you see what I'm saying? It, it's not, that's, that's definitely not what's going on here. Um, God is not obligated to keep, a, to keep a promise based on something that we didn't understand. If I told my children, I said, I will give you ice cream if you clean your room. And so then they don't clean up their room and they say, well, you said you were going to give me ice cream. I'm not obligated to give them ice cream just because they didn't understand what I said. You, you get it? It's the exact same thing. God doesn't have to, oh, well, gee, I, I didn't know that you were going to jerk me out of context. Well, now I guess I got to give you the sports car. And you, I actually grew up with people quoting this verse a lot, asking for cars and houses um, I think it's God's will for me to have that house. God, if you would give it to me in the name of Jesus. And it's like, well, that's not really Christianity and it isn't for our own personal benefit, although we do benefit greatly from Christianity and eternal benefit. However, that's in completely different terms, not really physical terms. We're not, we, Christianity doesn't make us rich. It doesn't, you know, fulfill our every desire. It's like on Napoleon Dynamite. If you vote for me, I will make your wildest dreams come true. That's not how, that's not how God is. Hey, if you pray to me, I'll make your wildest dreams come true. No, no, that's not, that's not, not how it is. And uh, all that that does is it makes pleasure our master rather than loving God and living for him. So let me give you kind of a, kind of a, Hypothetical that's not real hypothetical, it happens all the time, that maybe will help explain this a little bit better. Let's say I'm praying for my children. God, help my children to get saved. Help them to accept you. You know, Help them to come to the knowledge of you. Help them to you know, live their lives for you. But then I'm mistreating my spouse. Right? Any way you want to take that, you take it. You're mistreating your spouse in some way. Maybe I'm even trying to get my kids on my side against my spouse. Well, you know how your mother is, more stubborn than a mule. Yeah, that's a real good idea to tell your kids, right? <laughs> uh, so I'm mistreating my spouse, and then I'm holding on to harms. You know, somebody did me wrong, and uh, I'm just not going to let it go. So that prayer is not going to get answered because, first off, God's going to oppose me. First off, because I'm, I'm proud. I'm being proud. I, I want to admit my, my wrong. But also because God opposes the prayers from a wicked heart. If we are not submitted to him, he's not obligated to answer our prayers. 
But then also people are going to oppose me and my spouse is going to oppose me and say, there's nothing to that religion of yours. It's nonsense. My kids are going to oppose me. They're going to say, hey, you know, you don't even treat mom, right? This is nonsense. My actions are going to speak. And as much as I say, oh, Jesus, 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 my actions say, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. My children will be put off by my constant conflicts with people, by my constant gossiping and bad-mouthing people, by my shallow relationships and people who do nothing but encourage my bad attitude. They'll get turned off by the fact that I hop from church to church and, and leave a wake of problems behind me. And uh, just a side note, though, I did want to mention this, that they actually did a study, and if you do not put a high value on, on attending church services, it's, it's shown that your kids will not put a high value on religion and, at all. So what I'm, what I'm getting at here, here is if you say, oh, I, I don't really need to go to church, and I can just love God on my own and do my own thing, I, I get where you're coming from, but... Statistically speaking, your children will say God isn't real, has, and I don't want anything to do with this. Just a, a little point. It doesn't really have anything to do with the sermon, just something worth mentioning. And then another thing that kind of turns off our kids is when we have wishy-washy obedience. Let, let me kind of say it a different way. Well, God told me to do this, and then a couple months or a couple years later, you know, all, all of a sudden God's telling you to do something else. When I was in uh, Bible college, this, ha this thing happened all the time. Hey, God told me that we should date. Then, you know, a couple weeks later when they found out that, you know, things just weren't going how they wanted, hey, God told me we should break up. Isn't that funny how God is just as wishy-washy as you? <laughs> oh, God told me to go here into ministry. Oh, well, it got a little bit too difficult, and I don't really like those people. So God told me to go somewhere else. Huzzah! It doesn't really work like that. And when we do that kind of stuff and don't follow through on the things that God commands us to do, our kids, they aren't really going to see that. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. The things are very much so together. So let's look at verse 14. I'll read it, and then we'll go to some go to some points here. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Now, notice there's some parts there. We might not understand it, but there's some parts there that we kind of leave off. We say, hey, I can ask for anything, and I'll get it. Okay, but there were some parts in there we dropped off. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So the question is, what the heck does in my name mean? Well, let's look at that. Good question. I'm just you guys are not enjoying this tonight, but I am super enjoying this. I, uh, I love looking at uh, specific verses like this. So first off, the name, the, the word name. Um, it's, it, it's funny how culture kind of, kind of changes. If I said, you know, if I talk like this today, people really aren't going to know, know what I'm talking about. But in olden times, um, someone's name was their reputation. It was their character. Okay, it was um, it, it, when when a son did something, for instance, it was a reflection on the father, and the father's household, and the father's name. It either brought him glory or shame. It was an honor shame society. If you've never experienced an honor shame society, it's a very different thing from in America. Um, I actually had a Greek professor who. One, when he was, this is 100 years ago, when he was in school, um, one of his co-students um, was shamed by his professor, and he took it as a personal insult to his family's honor, and he went out and killed himself. Um, the professor didn't mean it like that because he grew up in America where we don't have that, and so he was just, you know, razzing the student a little bit too rough, and the student misunderstood coming from a different culture, and uh, it did not end well. And um, it's just things like that that kind of maybe help you see how other societies worked. And very much so, um, during the days of Jesus, there was very much so an honor and shame uh, society. And the, son, the actions of the son very much so added to the honor or shame of the father, which is kind of important to, when, to remember when you're reading stories about how, like, the prodigal son, right, where he begs for, I mean, not begs, he demands the, the father to give him his portion. Um, that was tantamount to cursing him. And um, which in itself was worthy of death. And then, you know, going off and, and acting like a fool, that would have greatly shamed the father. It would have been shame upon shame, and then the father was still so willing to accept him back. It's just amazing um, when you con consider the, 
the context. So here in verse 14, he said, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Well, name means reputation or, or, or character. And this is what I want to get here. Um, we Christians are sent in Jesus's name and ask according to his name. Now, this might sound like, oh, power stroke. That's not what I'm talking about at all. The idea here is that we are Jesus's ambassadors. We are sent to do his work. We are not the king. We represent the king. Okay? That's how ambassadors, <laughs> that's how ambassadors do. And so what that means, it goes a step further. When we pray, we are supposed to be praying according to the king's desires, not according to our own. Now, what does that mean? Well, do you think that Jesus sent you here on earth to praise that you get all the houses and the cars and all the different shiny things that you want? Do you think that that's a good reflection of the king? I don't. Do you think that Jesus sent us here so that we could accumulate all the wealth possible before we die? I don't think that's it either. Our prayers are meant to reflect what the king wants. Our prayers represent God and his interests, and they testify that we are his. When we pray, it should be a testament to who really owns us. So I want you to think over the past week and think about the different things that you've prayed. God, that you would punish these people, that you would just, you know, uh, slaughter them and that they, uh, they would get what's coming to them. Well, do you think that's a reflection of the king as you are his ambassador? Or do you think that that's a reflection of trying to put yourself on the throne? When we pray, our prayers represent God and his interests, and they testify that we are his. If our prayers are out of alignment with God's will, we need to change. Ambassadors relay the wishes of the nation. A lot of times I hear people relaying the wishes of maybe America, maybe their political party, not, not so much our true king. And I think that that's something that we need to eventually face. There's nothing wrong with patriotism and nationalism so long as it doesn't get in the way of our true country. Ambassadors are meant to relay the wishes of their nation, not themselves. Likewise, we are honor bound. We are honor bound to present Christ by what we say and what we do. Our prayers, our actions, and our attitudes are all connected. We, we, we pray that God would do things. We also do what God tells us to. We pray and we also trust. We ask, we obey. Our prayers, our actions, our attitudes, they're all very much so connected. Think about this. When you, when you go to prayer, right, and you're upset about something, you, maybe you have a selfish prayer. God bless me that you would just give me all these things and help me to never have any health problems and you know everybody else can just bite the dust. Or maybe you're angry and you're praying from a place of anger. God, that you would curse them, you would judge them for what they did, and you would remember how they did this and... Well, I think you kind of get my point. Or maybe we're trying to pursue vengeance in our actions and our thoughts, right? Oh, man, I, oh, I just really wish that Chuck would get what's coming to him. Golly. Just... Or maybe we try, we try and take vengeance in our own hands. Maybe, maybe we think that we're better, though, because we're doing it in that passive-aggressive way that Pastor was talking about this morning. <laughs> You cut me. You, you cut in front of me on the road. You know I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna flip you off. Then everybody would know that I'm upset. But I'm gonna just so happen to be in your way when we get up the road a bit. You know that passive aggressive vengeance thing. We don't just do it when we're driving. We do it all the time. And uh, the, the main point here being, is that an accurate representation of the king that we are ambassadoring for? When we say snide comments. We are misrepresenting Christ, and we are not, in his name, obeying his commands. It's really easy to attach a little, well, in the name of Jesus at the end of every prayer, it's a lot harder, a lot harder to follow that up with obedience. Pastor said it best a couple Sundays ago. He said, pray big, yeah, but obey big, too. 
We can't sit there naming and claiming a God that you would work all these miracles and you'd, you know, do this and do this and do this. And I'm not going to actually obey you. I'm not going to do what you told. I'm going to hold on to my bad attitude. I'm going to just, you know, snip at other people's hills. I'm, I'm going to just go around causing problems. I'm not going to resolve anything. I'm, it's okay for me to hate my, uh, I actually was talking to, talking in the young adults group, uh, I guess it was two weeks ago or no, I was talking to, to Nicole. Um, maybe it was in, I don't remember when it was. I think I was talking to Nicole anyways. And um, man, I really wish I could remember. Anyways, um, and we were talking about the way that in Christianity even, it's acceptable for you to hate your ex-spouse. I mean, hey, it's okay because they did me wrong. They're an idiot or whatever. So I don't have to forgive them because they're my ex. I can love the whole world, but I have to forgive my ex. Well, I don't know what Bible you're reading, but I don't see that anywhere in the Bible. Ambassadors have to relay the wishes of their nation. If we want to, if we want to pray these big prayers, we got to obey big. What I see a lot on the on TVs and, and on the TV and a lot of popular Christian books is they go to great lengths about how to pray these world moving prayers, but then they say, "Hey, sin isn't really that big of a deal." I mean, you know, ah, whatever. You know, you don't really worry about that. Don't really worry about obeying God or, you know, that stuff. No, you live, you live however you want. Just pray these big prayers. Um, another thing that I see quite frequently is, well, I'm going to pray big, and, and, and if God answers, then I'll obey. What? It, that's that's kind of saying, God, you know, hey, if I want to scratch your back if you scratch mine. And that's not really how it works. Us and God aren't equal. Praying in his name is according to his character. It's according to his will. It's according to his nature. It's doing it and praying as he himself would. In the name of Jesus means as he himself would. And here's the thing. Jesus definitely will answer that when we have when we have. His, what, what, what he wants, and when we are submitted to him. He might not answer it in the way that we want, but he will definitely move in that situation. He won't give us whatever we want, and we can't live however we want and just tag on in the name of Jesus at the end. So that takes us to the second part of this. Hey, ask for whatever you want as long as there are two of you. This one actually kind of confuses me because it's from, a, it's from a part that Jesus is not actually talking about prayer. People always say, you know, where two or more of you are gathered. So you're saying Jesus will only answer prayers if there's two people together? That doesn't make much sense, and I'll tell you why it doesn't make much sense in just a second. Let's take it this a little bit by little bit. First off, what's happening in Matthew chapter 18? Because we were in, Matthew, in John chapter 14. We were looking at something completely different. Now let's look at this. What the heck is going on? First off, it should be noted that as far as I know of, this is this is only recorded in this gospel, I believe. I'm like 99% sure. And in nowhere in the Bible does it ever say anything about two people having to be together to pray about something. So we need to ask the question, well, is, so if we're going to establish a whole new doctrine that there has to be two people, are we even sure that this is talking about prayer? Well, let's look at Matthew 18. First off, it, stops, it starts earlier in Matthew chapter 18 about, um, you know, hey, temptations are going to come, but woe to the person through whom they do come. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Off your hand, chop it off. And he's going through all these different things about, uh, about not tempting people and not giving in to temptation. Then he goes from that talking about how God doesn't want people to perish. He doesn't want people to die. And then after that, he talks about uh, church discipline um, in verses 15 and, and on through here. And then after he's done talking about disciplining people, he goes to a part about forgiving. Now, let's think about how these things logically fit. How does not tempting people fit with God doesn't want people to die? Well, it kind of, the, uh, the connection is pretty obvious. How, and what about the connection between God not wanting people to die and bringing Discipline in a church. Because when you bring discipline in a church, you should do it from a place remembering of God's heart. A pastor should not ever be super excited to be kicking somebody out of his church or to be dealing with, dealing with somebody's sin. That shouldn't ever make him happy. So what's the connection between 
as think about this, between bringing discipline and forgiveness. Because hopefully it will end with forgiveness and restoration, right? <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> so these things all are connected. But what's not anywhere in Matthew chapter 18 in this part here is prayer. He has not talked about prayer at all. He's talked about disciplining, and then he goes on to forgiveness. And this verse is in between where he's talking about church discipline. Go one at a time, then take somebody else with you, then bring it to the church. and then and So he's talking about how to, how to bring correction. And then he goes on to talking about forgiveness. Nowhere in there does he talk about prayer. And actually, if you were to include something about prayer, it would break Jesus' flow of what he's trying to talk about. But see, it gets even worse because if this is about prayer, then that means that the Bible contradicts itself. And let me, we'll read the verse before we get ahead of ourselves here. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. So obviously you should see at the beginning of the verse that this is a continuation of a thought. Again, I say to you, so okay, there's something that I have just said and I am rewording it. Okay, so what did he just say? He just talked about bringing correction, how you go to the person. If they don't listen, you bring someone else. Then if they don't, still don't listen, you bring it to the church. And then he says, where two or more of you are gathered. So the obvious implication here is that when a church has to bring discipline, Jesus will be with them while they're bringing the discipline. I think it's important, though, that he does specifically mention two because there should be, according to the law, there should be a witness of at least two. Very important. In fact, it says two or three. So if this is about prayer, then that means that the Bible contradicts itself. And there are three reasons. When you're talking about two or more is, is not for prayer, there's, there's three reasons. First off, the requirement that he just gave in John did not say that there had to be two or more. It said, in my name, I will answer. It didn't say if there are two or more, I will answer, but in my name, and I will answer. That's the first thing. The second thing is in James chapter 5, verse 16. Notice the wording here. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. A prayer of a righteous person, singular, when it is brought about, can accomplish much. Now, let me give you a little just quick with Greek. Greek doesn't always have to have an expressed um, object. So how this is, is it's actually, um, a person isn't there in the Greek. Okay, It's a prayer of a righteous. A, a righteous what? <laughs> and so you, you see some translations say, man, person. Whatever, it gets the same, same idea across. Uh, either way, we're talking about a singular, a prayer of a righteous one, that's good enough, when it is brought about can, can accomplish much. So that would mean that we have now two references, I'm sorry, two uh, references that prayer does not have to have more than one person. So then we go to the third thing. Um, now, the, there are lots more examples. I stopped at three because I felt like three was enough. When Elijah is prophesying against King Ahab, it says very specifically that he went and prayed, and the rain stopped. And then he went and prayed by himself again, and the rain started. He didn't have to have two. So if Jesus in Matthew is saying, hey, there has to be two of you to pray about something, first off, that doesn't really make much sense. Second off, the Bible doesn't teach that anywhere. Third off, the Bible then contradicts itself. Fourth off, or third off, I guess, Jesus went off to, uh, alone to pray all the time. It says throughout the Gospels, and Jesus went off to try and pray. And people went and interrupted him, and then he went off and tried to pray by himself again. So I think that the obvious conclusion here is that Matthew 18, 19 even, is even talking about prayer. So did Jesus really say, hey, ask whatever you want as long as there are two of you? No, he did not say that. He said that if you ask something in his name, he will answer it. Yes. And were there two or more that has nothing to do with prayer? Now, here's the thing. Obviously, Matthew 18 is not about prayer. But church leaders bringing discipline. The only people who I've ever seen making it, this verse about prayer do so because they have an authority problem with church leaders telling them what to do. I have never seen somebody who does not have an authority problem with the church 
teaching this as a, as a way. That doesn't even make sense. So you're saying that I can't go around walking around Tola Rosa praying for people unless, I'm, unless someone else goes with me? So, so what Jesus is just like, okay, you're praying. I hear you. I'm going to ignore you because there's only one of you. That just doesn't really make sense. In no world does that make sense. It's a very important that we pay attention to the context, not just jerking something out. Of, doesn't that give you more hope? Think about this. Doesn't this give you more hope that you can pray anytime, anywhere, and God hears you? Or you can only pray if there are two of you. Which one gives you more hope? There was actually a person who taught at this church years ago, which is years upon years ago. If you are old enough to remember, please don't tell somebody who they are. <laughs> there was, anyways, there was a person who, who taught a class here years ago, and they actually taught that you should not pray for the community unless there were at least two of you. They actually taught that. Um, and then I was actually teaching a devotion, and Lauren, my, my singer here, um, made the comment. She said, so I can go out and pray all by myself? Like, I can drive around Tularosa and pray? And I said, yeah, why wouldn't you be able to? She said, you know, I saw you out walking and praying for Tularosa, and I, I thought maybe. And I said, well, why, why, why wouldn't you be able to? And evidently, they, they were taught all kinds of things. Um, demonic powers would overtake them, which I was like, wow, your God's pretty weak if going out and praying for somebody leads to you being overtaken by evil. Like, wow. So I'm all out there trying to pray for somebody, and then Satan, like, what, hops under, in, under my skin, and now he controls me because I was praying for somebody? That doesn't make any sense at all. There's just a lot of weird things out there. And then, obviously, the thing that I've already said about 500 times, there's nowhere else in all of Scripture that teaches such a thing. So let, let's, let's wrap things up. First off, just like um, in that passage that we looked at two weeks ago where it looks like Jesus is saying that we're gods. He, he wasn't, but it looked like he was. And just like with that passage, misquoting Jesus leads to contradictions for the rest of the Bible. Jesus oftentimes says things that might be a little bit difficult to understand. Well, if you ignore all of the rest of the Bible, it gets even harder to understand. But if you take into account the rest of the Bible, so like, for instance, in Isaiah, God very clearly said, hey, there are no other gods. There never will be. I'm it. And so then we know that when Jesus said, hey, you are gods, that's not really what he, what he meant. We need to look at what he said, the context of what's being said. Well, the same is true here. If we go to a passage of Scripture, that, and it looks like Jesus is saying something, and it looks like it's contradicting the rest of the Scripture, chances are it's our understanding, because Jesus very clearly said, I didn't come to do away with those things. I, I came to, to fulfill them. The person who tells you to sin against the law, that, don't, don't listen to that person. Prayer is a very interesting thing. Prayer is a reminder of who our master really is. I, I find myself praying, and, and, and sometimes I get real upset, and I, you know, asking God that, you know, oh, vindicate me, God, that you would just show them that they're wrong. And, you know, and, and when I'm praying things like that, I realize that I'm living for myself, not for God. I realize that I'm praying not according to what the king wants. I'm being myself into the king. Prayer is a reminder of who our master is. Are we submitting ourselves in prayer? Are we submitting ourselves in total? Prayer is also a corrector to our bad attitudes. It's a corrector to our, to our desires. Sometimes I notice that I start living for myself, for, for pleasure, for, for material possessions. Prayer is for personal reflection of our hearts and our motives. It's very important. We have to learn how to pray according to what he wants. So let's look at that. First off, prayer is not a way of getting what we want. Prayer is not a way of manipulating God to get back at someone else. Well, I prayed. I fasted. Now they're going to get it. That's not what prayer is about. See, in his name means I am submitted to the king. I am praying as the king wants with the goals of the king.
God wants people to know him. God wants to work in impossible situations. God wants to show more of himself. God also wants us to repent. God wants, wants to change our hearts. God wants to change our attitudes. When we pray, we need to pray according to those things that he wants. When we pray, we need to pray according to those things that he wants. God gave us prayer, I'm sorry, promises for prayer because he wants us to pray. There's this idea going on, kind of unfortunately, in the past couple of years, that prayer does nothing. You know, hey, why pray about when you can do something? Well, obviously, you should be living for God. And you, you know, if it's within your power to do something, don't withhold good, obviously. It doesn't, that's not a contradiction of prayer. That means, yes, pray, but we shouldn't cease to do good things. In fact, Paul says that God pre-ordered things ahead of us for us to do good things. So obviously we're supposed to be doing good things. And that's not even the argument. But that doesn't mean that's a knock, not a knock on prayer, though. God gave us promises for prayer because he wants us to pray. He wouldn't give an, have given us promises if he didn't even want us to pray. The problem is, is that we have to unlearn a lot of the things that we've learned. A lot of the things that we've done throughout the years, we need to unlearn it. I, I remember one time, man, I was really in a dark place, and I was, you know, praying to God, and I was just, you know, real doing a lot of talking and not a whole lot of listening. And I tell you what, God actually did answer me. So over the next couple of years, my prayers became more and more and more and more and more selfish, more about me, more about me talking to God and not doing much listening and, you know, all these different things. And uh, gradually throughout the years, God started answering less and less. <laughs> he started. I got darker and darker in prayer. It never. It got to the point where it was just like I was talking to myself. Yeah, I was talking to myself. I had to unlearn going to God with that complaining, nitpicking, telling him about how he needs to do all these things differently, telling him about how it's unfair of what happened to me. I had to stop. I had to unlearn those things. And then I had to learn what God wanted me to pray for. God will give you direction in prayer? Yes, yes, he will. Remember, the king does give the ambassador suggestions. <laughs> we have to unlearn and then learn what and how to pray. Some of us have been taught to just have rep repetitive prayers, right? The, the now I lay me down to sleep and, you know, stuff like that. You know, just things that we do out of rote memory over and over and over again, meaningless. Things that don't really aren't from, from our heart, they're just things that we do in a regular tradition. Some of us have been taught to pray for selfish things. You know, all of our greatest dreams to come true. Some of us have been taught to just name and declare and point and shout and that God's just kind of going to have to do something. You will be healed and you do this and you will do this and I have all the power. I don't even need Jesus. I mean, man, oh man, am I great. And oh, in the name of Jesus. And that's just, that's just not, that's not how it, that's not, we need to unlearn those things. And instead we have to relearn. We have to learn the right way and unlearn the wrong way. Prayer is not about demanding. It's about asking. It's about trusting. It's about submitting. See, we don't like that part. Well, we definitely don't like that part. We don't want to ask. We want to demand. We don't want to have discernment. We just want to do whatever feels right. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing uh, in us and through us. God, I pray you'd encourage everyone here with the knowledge that anywhere they are, they can always come to you in prayer. No matter where they are, no matter if they're all by themselves or if they're a group of 500, that you're always, always there. Lord, help us to be quick to repent and to turn from our sins that we could ask truly in your name. Pray that you'd bless those who are here tonight and those who are watching online. God, that they would have a good week. Help them to stay healthy and for those who are sick to feel better quickly. Lord, we love you for all that you do, for all that you are. Amen.